official says Russia, Russia has launched almost a thousand missiles since the invasion of Ukraine began. An advisor to President Volodymyr Zelensky reports Ukrainian forces are now beginning counterstrikes against Russians in several directions. And a frightening situation for journalists as well. Uh, this is a crew from the Russian language network Current Time. They came under Russian artillery fire northwest of Kyiv. Fortunately, they were not hurt. President Zelensky brought his plea for more help directly to the American Congress in a virtual speech Wednesday. He referred to pivotal moments in U.S. history, reminding lawmakers assembled there of the urgent response that the U.S. had to Pearl Harbor or to September 11th. He reiterated his request for a no-fly zone, saying Russia has turned the Ukrainian sky into a source of death. Finally, he had a message for President Joe Biden. The President Biden, you are the leader of the nation, of your great nation. I wish you to be the leader of the world. Being the leader of the world means to be the leader of peace. Well, after Mr. Zelensky's speech, President Biden signed off on an additional $800 million in security assistance to Ukraine. It will include, and this is quite uh, crucial because it's what politicians here and people are demanding, anti-aircraft systems, but also drones, grenade launchers, guns and ammunition. The aid stops short of a no-fly zone or fighter jets over concerns that that would lead to direct conflict with Russia. But the U.S. president did make his harshest condemnation yet of Vladimir Putin, a remark you're about to hear that the Kremlin called unforgivable. He is a war criminal, said Biden, with attacks on schools, hospitals, bomb shelters, and now even bread lines. You don't have to look too far for evidence of potential war crimes. CNN's Oren Lieberman reports from the Pentagon. On the streets of Cherniv in northern Ukraine, they came looking for bread when the Russian shells landed. A regional official says 10 people were killed in the bombardment, the latest victims in the Russian attacks that have claimed more and more civilian lives. In the city of Mariupol, hundreds sought shelter in the drama theater. Their fate now unknown after the city council says Russia bombed the building. The word deti was written on both sides of the building. It's Russian for children. Recent drone footage reveals the larger devastation inside the southern city, conditions being described as unbearable and just hell by residents who've been able to flee. Almost uh, 350, 400,000 people now locked in the city without food, water, uh, heating supply. Uh, now it's still cold in Ukraine and uh, the, the fate of uh, thousands of people is uh, absolutely uncertain. Another apartment building hit in the capital, Kyiv, near the city center. As the streets are deserted for a 35-hour curfew. Even escape has become difficult. A civilian evacuation convoy en route to the city of Zaporizhia came under Russian attack, according to local officials, wounding five. Ukraine has struck back, destroying a number of Russian helicopters near the occupied city of Kherson. The conflict raging as negotiations show some promise. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says he hopes for compromise. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky vows his country will not fold. The meetings are ongoing, as I'm told. The positions are sounding more realistic. But we need more time to get decisions in the interests of Ukraine. With acts of protest growing more public in Russia, President Vladimir Putin called some of his own citizens traitors. Obviously, the West will try to rely on the so-called fifth column, on national traders, on those who earn money here with us, but live there. And I mean live there, not even in the geographical sense of the word, but according to their thoughts, their slavish consciousness. Meanwhile, the U.S. is working on getting more lethal aid to Ukraine, which is pushing for more advanced weaponry. NATO reiterating that the alliance is united in the decision not to impose a no-fly zone over Ukraine. We see death, we see destruction, we see human suffering in Ukraine, but this can become even worse if NATO uh, took actions that actually 
turned it in, in, this into a full-fledged war between uh, NATO and Russia. Orrin Lieberman, CNN at the Pentagon. All right, well, joining me now live here in Lviv is Michael Busserk, who is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Thanks for joining us. Uh, you, we were speaking earlier, and you argue that there's a need for not just a, a, an overall fly zone, but potentially a humanitarian no-fly zone over some parts of Ukraine. How would that work? Yeah, absolutely, because I don't think we see the political will right now for the West to do a complete no-fly zone over mm -hmm. Ukraine. So let's look at uh, past history where in other theaters of war, I think this was done where you have a humanitarian uh, no-fly zone over a certain part of the country, in this case, Western Ukraine, where there are a lot of internally displaced people mm -hmm. here seeking shelter and protection. And I think that would be that would come across, I think, to the West and to Mr. Putin as less as a, of a confrontation, mm -hmm. that this is purely for humanitarian reasons. But whether, again, the political will is there in, in the West is difficult to tell. Because you'd have to enforce it. It would have to be enforced. But, you know, the other thing is uh, Mr. Zelensky is still also pressing for those Polish uh, MiG jets to mm -hmm. come here. Mm -hmm. And I'd also argue, uh, Hala, is that uh, what's the difference between providing lethal weaponry and these jets? I mean, it's, it's already the precedent is there as well. But I'm getting very worried that, again, the West does not have the ability or the willingness to come to Ukraine's aid, uh, assistance. And I think the feeling I'm getting from a lot of people here is that we are pretty much in this alone, mm -hmm. and we're protecting, you know, the, the NATO's uh, eastern flank. And uh, I think what you're going to see is more and more kind of micro alliances with neighboring countries who also feel threatened by Mr. Putin. Do you think there's any hope right now at this stage in those talks that Russia and Ukraine are conducting? Because we're hearing from Lavrov sort of the yeah, beginning yeah. of a, of, we're getting the sense from him that there may be some overlap where there was none a few days before. Same with, with Zelensky. Any, any hope on that front, do you think? I think the Russians like to project a bit of uh, a diplomatic front that, yes, we're talking, yes, we understand, yes, we're going to negotiate over this and that. But I know from my own time here with the OSC, mm -hmm. I was here in 2014, 2015, mm -hmm. we had multiple talks with the Russian-backed thugs in Donetsk and also, you know, representatives mm -hmm. from Moscow. And each time a ceasefire was negotiated, it was broken shortly afterwards. Mm -hmm. There's a pattern of lying in deceit uh, on the Russian side, and I don't think we should expect anything less right now. It's a bit of a different situation, only in the sense that here mm -hmm. the Russians are certainly not performing the way they had hoped. Their, right. ru their ground advances have stalled. They're starting to use crude yeah. uh, aerial bombardments on clearly uh, marked civilian targets. Uh, I mean, what does that tell you about their what their what their intentions are? Yeah, their intentions are to throw everything they have, and these crude missiles are the same ones they also use in Donetsk. Mm -hmm. They're we call them kind of stupid missiles. They're not guided, and they land anywhere, but most of the time in populated uh, centers with maximum damage. Mm -hmm. So it would be a kind of scorched earth policy, sad to say, and then perhaps they'll retreat. But uh, it, it's very sad what we're. But to see, I think, happen to more civilian deaths and destruction. Uh, and then, of course, it's going to push more people out of the country in the mm -hmm. short to medium term. We're probably looking at uh, upwards of 10 million, which is a quarter of the Ukrainian population. What could, at this stage, make Putin uh, retreat, turn back, stop this insane war? China. I think yeah. that's the only leverage uh, the West has left with Mr. Putin is to put pressure on Beijing. Because don't forget, China also has interests here, economic interests. Before the violence began, uh, President Zelensky called uh, China their closest economic partner. A lot of uh, energy and food security for China uh, depends on Ukraine. Not entirely, mm -hmm. but part of it. So they don't, I don't think they want to see Ukraine uh, destructed or Ukraine totally in Russian hands. So. That's the only space I think uh, we have left, sadly. And do you think that the, the willingness is there on China's part right now or not? Hard to say. I think at the moment they're playing a waiting game, watching what's happening. Because don't forget, this is, of course, a lesson for Xi Jinping when it comes to Taiwan. Yeah. Um, I think the stomach of the Chinese dragon is growling right now, mm -hmm. seeing, looking at Taiwan and seeing what's happening here. But at the same time, I think China has a sense of pragmatism in it, that there's economic energy interests here that need to be protected. But also it can't be happy that this is really disrupting what it hoped would be its post-COVID economic recovery. And this is really driving commodity prices up. They're so sensitive to those commodity prices. Yes. I wonder at what point does China come in and say, and what could they say? Because 
by some accounts, Putin is delusional right now. He doesn't mm -hmm. even realize yeah. how badly his army is suffering on the ground in some cases and how some of his tanks and helicopters are getting shot out of the sky. Can China even do anything at this stage? I think that uh, trip of Putin to Beijing uh, during the Olympics was very important. And yeah. I, I would think that uh, this was discussed and that he was given sort of an OK to come here. But I don't think neither of them thought it would go that badly for mm -hmm. Russia and mm -hmm. this long, I think only a few days. And I think the thinking then was to maybe grab key interests in, in the, that land bridge, for example, between Russia and uh, Crimea to establish mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But they seem to be intent on keeping on going and, uh, again, more death and destruction. Michael Batsuki, thank you very much for joining us here live in Lviv. We're going to take a quick break. More of our breaking news coverage after this. Some Russians go abroad to do what's not allowed at home, speaking out against the war. Still ahead, we go to an anti-war concert in Istanbul where a Russian rap artist amplified the anti-war, Russian anti-war message. We'll be right back. War message. We'll be right back.